individuals that are genetically susceptible to rheumatoid arthritis, the immune system produces an antibody which combines with an antigen. This antigen is suspected to be peptidoglycans and is present in peptidoglycans positive organisms like Yersinia enteropolitica or Klebsiella or Amoeba and they form a complex, antigen antibody complex. So, this complex in B27 organisms, in B27 positive individuals is usually not seen in blood, therefore they are called as zero negative. Usually they are young males and it deposits where the bone and the periosteum is attached to by the ligaments. And when they deposit here, they produce an inflammatory reaction which is called as enthesmopathy. Initially you have tenderness and pain which is aggravated in morning. Especially in cold, wet weather, and then gradually it gets associated with stiffness, deformity, and these ligaments calcify, leading to what are called as syndesmophytes and there is bony ankylosis. So typically in a young male there is pain, spasm and tenderness in the morning and gradually there is deformity of the spine and the large joints of the lower lip. Also, there can be soft tissue involvement. And here you can have uveitis, urethritis and arthritis, which is typical of Reiter's syndrome. Or you can have colitis, which is typical of enteropathic arthritis. Or you can have involvement of skin, which is psoriasis. So this is called as psoriatic arthritis. But if there is no soft tissue involvement, then ankylosing spondylitis is divided into, this is the sacroiliac joint and this is the spine. So it is, involves the sacroiliac joint primarily and ascends into spine. This is called as the primary ankylosing spondylitis or Mary Strumpel disease and then it can involve the sacroiliac joint and descend into the large joints of the lower limb which is called as the secondary ankylosing spondylitis or also called as Bashrew's disease. 
so these are the various names associated with b27 positive or zero negative spondyl arthritis on the other hand in dw4s the immune complex deposits in the metacarpophalangeal joints or the proximal interphalangeal joints of the hand and the wrist the p the mp joint the wrist the mp joint and the ip joints of the hand the involvement is symmetrical synovial small joint in fact fertile female of 40 fat fair fertile female of 40 so what happens that the synovium gets thickened the synovial fluid become increases and becomes poisonous the cartilage is denuded the capsule and the ligaments become displaced and disbalanced leading to instability and deformity so there is pain there is swelling there is instability there is deformity and there is ankylosis in the region of the wrist the deformity is palmar wrist and metacarpophalangeal joints the deformity is palmar flexion and ulnar deviation in the fingers there can be hyper extension of the pip joint and flexion of the dip joint which is called as swan neck deformity or there can be flexion at the pip joint and hyper extension at the dip joint which is called as boot near deformity or also called as button hole deformity and in the thumb if this is the index finger and this is the thumb there is flexion at the at the mp joint of the thumb and extension at the ip joint which is called as the z deformity now with this with this in the background you would be able to approach a case and say which type of arthritis this is and what are the basic types of deformities so you will be able to answer the question of what is your diagnosis why do you say so any dd and why not that these four questions you would be able to answer the fifth question is how would you investigate so if you know the etiopathology the first thing that you would like to find out the organism for which you may do cultures against known organisms that are associated with the disease you can find out genetic susceptibility by doing the hla typing then you can find out about rheumatoid factor and other indicators of inflammation like c reactive protein erythrocyte segmentation rate 
serum uric acid immunoglobulin levels because these high raised immunoglobulin levels lead to amyloid which can affect the kidney so you can go and do kidney function tests and as these produce uh, effects on the due to atherosclerosis therefore you should test for renal retinal cardiac and cerebral stroke symptoms of vascular disease there so and you can do investigations which uh, support the associations soft tissue associations like eye involvement so in rheumatoid arthritis the association can be lacrimal gland or salivary glands when we call it jogren syndrome they can be lymph nodes or the reticular endothelial system hepatospinomegaly lymphadenopathy hepato spinomegaly and lymphadenopathy in children this is called as stills disease in adults in in uh, adolescents it is called as juvenile rheumatoid arthritis or or felty syndrome all these are mcqs so these are the possible investigations uh, then you can have involvement of membranes like pleura and pericardium and in pleura and pericardium you have what is called as kaplan syndrome so these are the variants of rheumatoid arthritis and these can be the possible investigations there may be some more finally you plan the treatment you can't do anything with genetics you can trace and eliminate organisms then you have to do something with the immune articular system the immune inflammation and basically you use demards in that for zero negative you use sulfa salicylic for zero positives you can use penicillin levamizol or gold or you can use immunosuppressors immunosuppressors are cyclophosphamide as a thioprene and methotrexate methotrexate has been the most commonly used in rheumatoid arthritis so this is to control the disease then you can do a synovectomy so that if you can't remove the disease you remove the disease tissue you can do balancing operations to correct deformity like tenodesis or tendon transfers then you can fuse joints to eliminate pain and fuse them in functional position and if movement is desired as on mp joints then you can do artho artho plasties and this is you use silastic implants
so the most important thing is diagnosis what is it what joints are involved what is the functional disability and what can you do so that the the function would improve and pain would decrease so this in short covers the approach to a case of rheumatoid arthritis and uh, then i advise you to see cert certain additional videos to these to understand the pathophysiology better and so that you can perform better in the competitive exams The dysregulation of multiple cytokine signaling pathways plays a critical role in the pathophysiology of rheumatoid arthritis. A continuous progression of uncontrolled cytokine-mediated inflammatory cascades results in chronic activation of multiple cell types, including T cells, B cells, monocytes, macrophages, and osteoclasts. These dysregulated signaling pathways contribute to the persistent inflammation, systemic illness, and joint destruction that is characteristic of RA. TNF-alpha is one such pro-inflammatory cytokine, and anti-TNF therapies have greatly improved treatment of the disease. There are other approved biologic RA treatments that target a single cytokine utilizing monoclonal antibodies or soluble protein receptors. These include anti-IL-6 and anti-IL-1 therapies. There are also approved treatments that target surface receptors on B cells or on T cells. However, despite recent advances, RA continues to be a clinical challenge with the development of treatment resistance and tolerability issues for many patients. In addition, parenteral administration and limited access to biologic therapies may pose significant barriers to optimal therapy of RA. New strategies that therapeutically modulate multiple pro-inflammatory cytokine signals by targeting intracellular signaling pathways that injectable biologics do not reach may provide new opportunities for treating RA. In 1988, a family of non-receptor tyrosine kinases, known as Janus kinases, was discovered. Additional work was conducted at the NIH to further characterize the role of these kinases in the regulation of intracellular signaling. The discovery of Janus kinases, or JAKs, was important because these intracellular proteins mediate the effects of many pro-inflammatory cytokines involved in several human diseases, including RA. It was subsequently shown that activation of many cytokine receptors known to be involved in RA promote pro-inflammatory gene expression by signaling through JAK pathways. These include receptors for multiple cytokines. In fact, these cytokines utilize JAK signaling pathways to regulate the inflammatory activity of many cell types involved in RA including T-cells, B-cells, and osteoclasts. Additional studies showed that JAK levels are significantly elevated in the inflamed RA synovium, providing further evidence of the importance of JAK-mediated signaling pathways. This suggests a potential novel therapeutic approach to the treatment of RA. Multiple pro-inflammatory cytokines utilize JAK signaling to modify gene expression associated with the chronic inflammation of RA. Cytokines signal cells by binding to specific cell surface receptors. A specific receptor type exists for each cytokine. There is an IL-6 receptor, an IL-15 receptor, and so on. For many cytokines, regardless of the receptor type, Binding by the cytokine results in activation of two intracellular Janus kinases attached to the cytoplasmic portion of the receptor. These activated JAKs in turn activate proteins known as signal transducers and activators of transcription, or STATs, which are also associated with the receptor. 
Stats are also recruited to the activated receptor and transduce signals within cells. In the final step of the pathway, activated stats regulate gene expression in the nucleus. Depending on the cytokine and the inflammatory cell, receptor activation and cytokine signaling results in a number of cellular events that accelerate inflammation and joint destruction, including increasing secretion of other pro-inflammatory cytokines, increasing osteoclast differentiation, and increasing bone resorption and cartilage matrix degradation. Thus, JAK-related intracellular signaling participates in a feedback loop that accelerates and sustains cytokine-mediated recruitment and activation of T-cells and other cells that promote joint inflammation and destruction. Exploring new cytokine signaling pathways important in the pathophysiology of rheumatoid arthritis, such as those involving JAKs, may result in new strategies for treating this challenging disease in the future. Rheumatoid arthritis is a common autoimmune disorder of the joints that affects about 1% of the population worldwide, more often women than men. The exact causes of the disease are unknown, but an individual's risk is thought to be increased by a combination of genetic and environmental factors. Many of the genes associated with rheumatoid arthritis are involved in immune system function. Non-genetic risk factors include age, diet, infectious agents and smoking. In an autoimmune disorder such as rheumatoid arthritis, the immune system mistakenly attacks and destroys the body's own cells and tissues, which immunologists refer to as self, and this autoimmunity can begin many years before joint symptoms are noticed. Doctors can use blood tests to identify this preclinical phase by the presence of multiple factors in the blood, such as autoantibodies and inflammatory factors. These early autoantibodies are thought to first develop outside of the joints, possibly in the gut, mouth or lungs. Environmental factors such as smoking can modify our self-proteins, making them targets for the immune system. One particular modification is called citrullination. When the immune system recognizes these modified self-proteins, it leads to a breach of self-tolerance and the production of autoreactive B cells and autoantibodies and later autoreactive T cells, the hallmarks of autoimmune disease. By the time that symptoms appear, the immune response has intensified and the antibodies produced target a broader range of self-proteins. But it's only in some patients that this systemic autoimmunity progresses to joint inflammation, which is possibly triggered by an increase in joint permeability and increased access to antibodies. Working out how to prevent this progression is a major goal for scientists. In patients who do develop joint disease, the small joints of the hands and feet are most commonly affected. After entering a joint, immune cells and autoantibodies bind to modified self-proteins in the cartilage, bone and lining of the joint called the synovium. This induces an inflammatory response and activates cells in the joint such as macrophages, neutrophils and osteoclasts, as well as blood monocytes. Activated monocytes differentiate into yet more macrophages, which together with other cells in the joint produce soluble inflammatory factors known as cytokines. Drugs targeting these cytokines are highly effective treatments for many patients. Left unchecked, however, damage caused by the inflammatory environment can expose new self-antigens to the immune system, continuing the cycle. At this stage, the first clinical symptoms of joint pain, swelling and warmth appear. Some patients recover, but most commonly, patients develop a chronic destructive disorder. As the disease progresses, dendritic cells display the newly exposed self-antigens and activate T-cells in the joint itself or in the local lymph node. 
In addition, B cells infiltrate the joint where they proliferate and produce antibodies and other factors, further amplifying the autoimmune response. Cells in the joint lining, called fibroblast-like synoviocytes, also proliferate and grow into the joint space, spreading across to the cartilage surface. These cells secrete matrix-degrading enzymes which erode the cartilage tissue. Bone is also eroded as osteoclasts, which contribute to normal bone turnover, become hyperactivated. Bone erosion, cartilage destruction and joint swelling cause severe pain, restrict movement of the joint and in the worst cases can cause joint deformities. And as well as the joints, other organs and body systems can be affected by the ongoing inflammation. For example, inflammation in the blood vessels can lead to heart disease. So early and aggressive therapy is recommended to prevent these systemic complications. By further understanding the immune markers and mechanisms of rheumatoid arthritis, it's hoped that targeted interventions could ultimately change the course of the disease. Hello, in this video we're going to look at rheumatoid arthritis, which is a systemic um, rheumatological disorder affecting multiple joints. The clinical presentation of rheumatoid arthritis is arthritis which is symmetrical. We have pain, swelling, as well as nodules around the area. Hand involvement is early in the disease and affects the metacarpophalangeal and proximal interphalangeal joints. In rheumatoid arthritis, there's also extra articular involvement, which we will look at later on. But first, let us look at the hand involvement in, in rheumatoid arthritis and see how it differs to osteoarthritis. So here is rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. So in osteoarthritis, the joints affected are the distal interphalangeal joints as well as the proximal interphalangeal joints. Whereas in rheumatoid arthritis, it is the proximal interphalangeal joints and the metacarpophalangeal joints. As well, you can have other um, joint involvement such as the wrist. So, so these joints are affected early in the disease, in rheumatoid arthritis. But as the disease progresses, you can have other features occurring in the hands. These are swan neck, boutonniere, or Z deformity of the thumb. So in swan neck, what you have is you have the distal interphalangeal joints flexed, but the proximal interphalangeal joints hyperextended. In boutonniere, it's the opposite. You have the distal interphalangeal joints hyperextended and the proximal interphalangeal joints flexed. The Z deformity of the thumb is essentially the thumb looking like a Z. It's, it's sort of bent, hyperextended. In the hands, the hands can also deviate medially. This is referred to as ulnar deviation. So they were the... They were the uh, the hand, what, what, what the features of the hands in rheumatoid arthritis. Let us actually look at what happens inside the joints. So let us zoom into the, this a finger here. And just to recap the anatomy, here we have the bone, the joint capsule, the synovial membrane, also known as a synovium. The synovial membrane, also known as a synovium, which produces the synovial fluid, which helps in lubrication. Um, as well as supplying nutrients to the area. Then we have the cartilage here in blue. In rheumatoid arthritis, you essentially have inflammation of the synovium, of the synovial membrane. You have a synovitis, and this causes pain and swelling, um, which occurs in rheumatoid arthritis. This also leads to bone and cartilage erosion, breakdown. Another feature we can see in the joints of um, rheumatoid arthri arthritic patients is angiogenesis. So that was the macroscopic view of the joint, just an overview. Let's look at it in a, more in a lot more detail at a cellular level. Let us zoom into this area and um, see what cells are involved. So just to, uh, just to show where we are, here we have the bone, the synovium, here is the fluid here in yellow, and blue is the cartilage. And again, I'm drawing the synovium really big because it is inflamed, right? The synovial membrane. 
Now, the synovial membrane is made up of these cells known as fibro, uh, fibroblast-like synoviocytes. And these guys are very important in the pathogenesis of um, rheumatoid arthritis. So again, rheumatoid arthritis is where we have inflammation of the synovial membrane, of the synovium. Now, the exact trigger of the, the inflammation of the disease is really not quite, un, not quite known. However, we are now looking at what cells we can find here and what cells are involved. So we have macrophages here, and they're, they're normally around here as well. But they, they essentially begin secreting cytokines, such as TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, and interleukin-6, which, of course, leads to inflammation. These cytokines also stimulate the fibroblast-like synoviocytes. When the fibroblast-like synoviocytes are stimulated, they, they essentially become activated, and then they begin to proliferate. At the same time, they also begin uh, assisting in the rank L expression, stimulating the rank L expression, which together with the cytokines here will stimulate osteoclast activity, which will lead to bone erosion, what we find in rheumatoid arthritis. When the fibroblast-like synoviocytes are stimulated and proliferate, they also begin secreting proteases. These proteases essentially cause the cartilage to break down. So we get cartilage degradation. And the cartilage also secrete proteases, and it's sort of like a feedback loop. Another interesting feature of, when, of the fibroblast-like synoviocytes is that when it's stimulated, when it's activated, these guys can actually migrate from joint to joint. So they can migrate from the hand joint on one side to the hand joint on the other. And this is why we get symmetrical arthritis in rheumatoid arthritis. We also can find T cells in the area, in the synovium. T cells make up about 50% of the uh, immune cells in this area, so they're very important in the pathophysiology. T cells uh, promote inflammation, essentially, and they, secrete, they can secrete interleukin-17, which will promote macrophage activity as well as stimulate the fibroblast-like synoviocytes. The T cells also help um, in the expression of rank L, which will stimulate osteoclast for bone erosion. We also find plasma cells in the area, and plasma cells only make up a small majority, about 5% of the immune cells, and they essentially assist in, in inflammation through cytokines as well as through antibodies. Now, in the fluid, in the synovial fluid, not in the synovial membrane, in the synovial fluid, we can find neutrophils. And neutrophils, they, they essentially produce proteases and reactive oxygen species, which will essentially cause bone and cartilage degradation, erosion. So they contribute to inflammation. In the synovial fluid, we also find the immune complexes, which is a feature of uh, rheumatoid arthritis. These immune complexes are essentially antibodies that bind to one another, and they essentially promote inflammation. So those are the cells that we can find um, in an inflamed um, joint in rheumatoid arthritis. Again, another feature around this area is that we see angiogenesis. Also, the cytokines that are produced by all these cells, they help um, increase vascular permeability and um, the expression of adhesion molecules on the vascular, vasculature, allowing for these immune cells to migrate um, into the joints. But where do all these cells come from? Why do they migrate into these joints and cause rheumatoid arthritis? Well, as I mentioned, we don't actually know, but there are a few theories out there. So let's go to the pre-rheumatoid arthritis phase before a person has rheumatoid arthritis. And there are many uh, possible things that could contribute to the development of rheumatoid arthritis. These include genetics, epigenetic modifications, smoking, a bacteria called Porphyromonas gingivalis, which can lead to gingivitis. Essentially, these things, they can cause modification of autoantigens. What do I mean by modifications of autoantigens? It essentially, what I essentially mean is modification of your own antigens um, to make it seem foreign to the immune cells. So you're modifying your... So these things can lead to modifications of your own antigens leading um, to an immune response. And the modifications of 
autoantigens include what's known as citrullination. So not only this, things can occur in the joints, such as you can have a synovial injury or hyperplasia, or you can have infection within the joint. And this will trigger you know, cytokine release and it will cause inflammation. This inflammation that occurs in the joints can also lead to modification of autoantigens, so modification of your own antigens, making it seem foreign. And this also includes citrullination. So because you have modifications of your own antigens, this will be recognized by antigen-presenting cells, and it will essentially activate the antigen-presenting cells to initiate an immune response. The antigen-presenting cell will migrate to the lymph nodes, where here I'm drawing the lymph node. Remember, the lymph node here is green, and within the lymph node we have the germinal center, where we have B cells. Anyway, the antigen-presenting cell will activate T cells here in the area, so we can have a CD4 T cell activation. And when the, CD4, uh, when the T cell is activated, the CD4 T cell, it can activate then B cells in the germinal center, and this can be through co-stimulation. When the B cells are activated, they will begin to, you know, proliferate, they will begin to class switch, and they will become plasma cells. Then plasma cells will then produce autoantibodies. They will produce the antibodies against your own antigen, essentially. So then what? Well, you have now CD4 T helper cells, and then you have the uh, antibodies and the plasma cells, and they will also have homing receptors and stuff like that, which will allow them to migrate to joint tissue. So that is how they move into the joints in rheumatoid arthritis. So I hope that made sense. Now it's important to talk about the antibodies because they're an important feature in rheumatoid arthritis. We have two main antibodies found. Um, and these are, we'll look at one, one, one of them at a time. So the first one is the rheumatoid factor, which is an IgM antibody, and it's present in 75% of people with rheumatoid arthritis. What these guys do is that they target FC portion of IgG antibodies, so the constant region. And they essentially are the ones that, are, that, that, in, that form the immune complex and can deposit in the synovial fluid. The rheumatoid factor not only, you know, um, forms immune complexes with, but, with itself, but with the IgG, as well as complement proteins. So it will promote inflammation. The second antibody is the anti-citrullinated uh, protein antibody. Now these guys, as the name suggests, they target citrullinated proteins. Um, these are things such as fibrin, and filigrin. Now, they target citrullinated proteins. What are they? Well, citrullinated proteins are essentially proteins um, who have arginine residues that have been converted to citrullinate. And this sort of change deems, makes it seem foreign to the body. And that is why uh, when we have modifications of our autoantigens, such as citrullination, our body thinks it's foreign. And unfortunately, in our joints, um, we have these sort of tissues. So therefore, um, that's, how it con so that's how this antibody contributes to the pathophysiology. Um, but essentially, these, these rheumatoid factor and anti-citrullinated protein antibodies, they're important for, in helping diagnose rheumatoid arthritis. Not everyone has rheumatoid factor, but the anti-citrullinated protein antibody, it is a lot more specific for rheumatoid arthritis. So I hope that all made sense. Now, it's important that we talk about the extra-articular involvement uh, within rheumatoid arthritis. So what I'm talking about is involvement of other organs around the body and how rheumatoid arthritis causes problems there too. So these extra-articular involvement is a result of the cytokines produced within the joints and stuff. And these are mainly TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, and interleukin-6. So within the blood, we have increase in inflammatory cytokines. And they essentially contribute to many things around the body. For example, in the skin, they contribute to the nodule formation. In the liver, because of the cytokines, the liver will begin 
um, producing more CRP or ECR proteins, which are inflammatory markers, as well as the liver will produce a lot more hepcidin, which will uh, contribute to anemia in rheumatoid arthritis. Cardiovascular involvement. Well, these cytokines and this inflammation that's occurring will actually promote um, arthrogenesis, so plaque formation. And it can also lead to uh, promote you know, myocardial infarction as well as stroke. Neurological involvement include uh, fatigue um, and depression. And these can be attributed to anemia. Um, bone involvement is very serious in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, sorry, musculoskeletal involvement. So these, these include osteopenia, which can lead to osteoporosis. Um, in the muscles, the infl inflammation causes, uh, can lead to insulin resistance, which, uh, which can result in muscle weakness. Um, and also bone marrow involvement. We can have thrombocytosis, which is a lot of platelet, which can contribute to, you know, to the, plaque uh, the throm thrombus formation, as well as we have anemia. So I hope that made sense, and I hope you enjoyed this video. We look. So those are the extra-articular involvement of uh, rheumatoid arthritis. You also have lung involvement, um, such as pleural effusion and lung infection. But this can be attributed to the treatment used for rheumatoid arthritis, which involves glucocorticoids. And as we know, glucocorticoids suppresses the immune system. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. We looked at the clinical manifestations, the hand involvement, the pathophysiology, uh, the causes, potential causes, as well as the articular manifestations of rheumatoid arthritis. Thank you for watching. Bye.